Hello, uh, welcome to Perspectives on the Church. I am joined today by Jonathan Dean, who is Director of Learning for Ministry at the Methodist Church. And Jonathan will be familiar to many in the diocese as well from his time at Queen's Theological College. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you, lovely to be with you. Um, I'm gonna pitch up a big question to begin with. What's the biggest challenge you think the church faces at the moment? It is, that is a big question. Um, I, I will come at this, um, I think, from an angle that will sometimes betray uh, my, my identity as a, as a Methodist, and some of the things I say may feel relevant uh, in other contexts. Uh, I may not, but I'll try anyway. I, I mean, I think that I think that as we emerge from the 15 months of, of lockdown, uh, one of the things I think I, I kind of feel is that one huge challenge the churches are, are, are wrestling with is about how to sort of reconnect in ways that are not purely digital with the communities that they serve and represent. Um, I think that actually that could be a challenge that's also a real opportunity and thinking a little bit about how we as church and Christian communities form relationships with our communities, I think is a really, really exciting uh, thing to ponder at this particular moment. But one of the things I think I notice in the churches in the last 10 years, at least probably longer, is, is, is a certain kind of, uh, I notice it in myself, if I'm honest, is a certain kind of sort of defensive crouch almost as we, as we think about the reality of decline, as we, as we kind of, as we sort of see dwindling numbers in our, in our pews, um, that I think sometimes there's a tendency to be anxious and fearful and slightly defensive about that. And uh, I think one of, the, one of the sort of great challenges of the Christian life is always to try amidst the things that make us anxious and fearful to hear the voice of the Spirit who uh, encourages, I think, encourages us, I think, not to, um, not to forget that God is with us, um, that, um, you know, God is not finished with us, and that, and that there are, you know, great missional opportunities all around us all the time. So I think it's something to do with that sort of re recovery of some sense of proper confidence, but also that um, renewed ability to make to make connections and form relationships uh, in the communities around us. That feels kind of quite prominent for me right now, anyway. Mm. That's brilliant. I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and many of us are kind of wondering about those things now um, as we reassemble. What do, you, what do you think people should expect and, and, and kind of be looking out for in, in that, in themselves or in those around them? I think the unexpected sometimes. Um, my own ministry, if I could be a little bit anecdotal for a moment, um, I think sometimes we, we kind of think that we will go to, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really a big fan of Church Away days and visioning things and you know I, that's great but sometimes I think that we can do that sort of in isolation from the reality of the life of the communities around us and one of the one of the great turning points in my own ministry um, I, I was really fortunate to spend a period of time working uh, in the United States in the Chicago area uh, and in the church I was serving uh, came into contact with um, Form, forms of doing ministry that relate to sort of broad-based community organizing. And one of the things that I learned from that that was so transformative um, is, is, is the truth that it's in encounter and in relationship. And to coin a, to coin a word that's quite, quite, quite popular in the church these days, it's in that sort of receptivity of, of being able to receive from someone else something that might enlighten our own understanding of our mission and our ministry uh, that often the spirit feels most most clearly to have to have shown up. So uh, I think that in a, in a sense, all true ministry, to misquote Martin Buber, begins with an encounter. And sometimes those encounters are surprising. I think the gospels are full of stories of surprising encounters that Jesus and the first Christians had with all kinds of people that transformed the way they think about their own mission. Um, I'm a I'm a Methodist. Uh, the, the passage in the New Testament that most fascinated the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, uh, was Acts chapter 10, and that remarkable story 
of Peter's encounter with the Roman centurion Cornelius. And although the, the, the upshot of the story is that Cornelius uh, embraces Christianity and is converted in a sense, there's this other remarkable subplot to the story in which Peter is also converted in some sense by his encounter with Cornelius uh, to a much more expansive, much more inclusive, much more generous sort of mind blowing understanding of what his faith means for him and for God's world. And Wesley uh, wrote kind of luminous notes on that passage because, because I think he thought it was an illustration of what happens when God's people genuinely engage in mission in a way that is both confident, but also humble. Uh, and it seems to me that it's that sort of combination that we need to kind of seek to rediscover uh, in our ministry today. What I learned um, at that particular point in my ministry where I began to be involved uh, with community organizing approaches to ministry was, was just how radically our vision is enlarged and our priorities are shifted by listening to people um, but not merely listening to them but but then sort of discerning together what it is we think we've heard in common and what then our what then our response to that needs to be uh, in the in the name of Christ really so it's 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 that kind of it's that kind of dynamic that I think is so is so important for the church to cling to and recover um it, it, in its life today and one of the one of the great gifts of that of course is that it teaches us not to be inappropriately or solely reliant on our ordained clergy in the ways that we do ministry like early methodism actually it's a it's a way of being and doing mission um that releases the gifts of all god's people uh, that that ensures that you know the gifts of, of the laity of the whole people of god are released uh, and not merely the gifts of those who those of us who are you know lucky enough to be to be ordained if that gets us a start um, i think that's, <laughs> that's absolutely fascinating and, and you seem to be kind of almost articulating a, a process um as much as anything else um and you and and it's a, a process which uh, asks for quite a humble disposition um, and I do. I want to take you back to something you said earlier as well. Um, I won't get the words right, but essentially that we're a bit kind of down on our uppers as, as church communities. That we're not feeling very confident about ourselves and uh, and who we are, and maybe even what we've got to offer nowadays. So, how do you think we kind of can be brave enough to be humble when we're already feeling um, like tense and anxious? Mm. I think some of that's a great question. It's quite hard to answer. I think some of it is about the experience, which I think in some ways God's people have had in every place and every age, which is around just having having to, you know, the importance of being a Christian community and not just individual Christians. That one of the things the church is supposed to offer to the world is a glimpse of what the kingdom of God might look like. Now, I know that's a kind of a slightly strange thing to say um, for anyone who's ever experienced a church community but that's our vision right that we we are supposed to offer to the world a glimpse of what it might look like to inhabit the kingdom of God and I think one of the things about that for me is um, the the assurance that I am I am not alone um, that all God's people are with me um, and we are with each other as we however tentatively try to take the next step in in mission together um, and and kind of just cultivating that that sort of sense of trust that the spirit of God has us and is with us and will inform and inspire us and won't let us down. Um, I also think that my own that my own kind of understanding of this balance between on the one hand confidence in the gospel and on the other sort of humility about what I might learn and the ways I might encounter God in the other um, has has been something which in my own experience, I've been really helped by my friendships with those of other faith, where, you know, a bit like Peter and Cornelius, a conversion has happened because of those friendships, um, which hasn't been about, you know, me becoming a Muslim, for instance. Uh, but I have learned most of what I think I know about how to be a person of faith who takes social justice seriously from a friend of mine who happens to be an imam. And, 
and, and it's something about that, I think, as well, that kind of has helped me to sort of get over uh, some of that, about the ways in which um, we can hold those two things together uh, and about the ways in which it's being in relationship with others, about caring for our communities together, that often actually help us to locate where God is at work and what God is, what God is saying. Um, Rowan Williams has this lovely phrase, which we all repeat a lot because it's so good, about that, that mission being, um, you know, the process by which we discern what God is already up to in the world and then join in. Um, and I think sometimes we're really surprised about those places and surprised about those expressions of mission. Um, but, but they come when we just have the courage, I think, to take a step uh, towards them and, 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 as I say, trust the rest to God to be with us. I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's simple, especially in the cultures we live in right now. Um, but I think the more we can have the confidence to, to, to start to engage, um, the, the easier it gets, in a sense. Um, and in a sense, maybe you've asked this question about kind of uh, answered it um, about what, what our resources are for doing that. But, but if if someone said, yeah, OK, I've got to get out there, um, I've got to hear from others, I've got to learn relationships that I probably haven't learned before. Um, I or we, you know, I as a disciple or, or we as a church community, um, what what? what what resources do you think we should be looking at to kind of help us to step into that? Hmm. I think the friendship networks we already have, um, most of us in our communities, um, either through our friends or indeed ourselves, have some connection usually to community groups. Um, I just moved into a new area uh, and because I'm, um, I'm a minister, so I live in a church-owned house, which happens to be in one bit of London. Uh, my work is at Methodist headquarters, which is in central London. And, and I've just been struggling really with the sense of living in a place where I don't really have any meaningful connection. And as I was struggling about what to do with this, uh, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you kind of go back to something that you did very early in your ministry and be a governor of a local school? And that seemed like a good idea. And I wrote to the local authority who, as it turned out, were desperate for people to be school governors. Um, and it's just been the most wonderful way for me to have a sense of a community, to have a sense of its needs, to have a sense of what the priorities might be, and actually to discover that, that the resistance to Christians and churches being engaged and involved is much, much less than, than I might have feared. So it's just one small example of the ways in which, you know, I think I think most of us actually can find our ways into things. It might be, it, it might be something very simple like supporting the local food bank. It might be something very simple like uh, working with the local local uh, citizens advice bureau, like my aunt in Dudley does. You know, it's just those ways into kind of trying to listen more carefully, um, which I think we all have. But it's, but sometimes. Maybe I'm just speaking about myself, but sometimes I think there's a slight tendency to divorce um, that bit of us, which is about our Christian life, from the rest of our from the rest of ourselves, which is about how we engage with our communities on a on a day to day basis. So I think I think my answer to your question is basically that we we can just keep it simple. Uh, right. It doesn't need to be more complicated than it than it than it is. Final question: uh, What gives you hope for the church? Oh, that's a great question too. Um, well, I'm a church historian by by training, and and one of the things I think that gives me great hope is to remember that we are not alone in the sense that not only do we have each other here and now, but we also belong to the communion of saints. And one of the things that I found really inspiring uh, in the last fifteen months, especially, really, is is to kind of be reminded of the ways in which, in a sense, we travel with those who have gone before us. Um, like most Christians, I guess I have particular um, sort of heroes of the faith that I look to. Um, one of the people I've looked to very consistently over a long period of time um, is Mother Julian of Norwich, who I think, you know, given that she lived in the 14th century, had the most remarkable things to say, sometimes uh, in a way that sort of contradicted the teaching of the church of her day uh, about the, the scope um, and the power of the love of God. 
And, and I'm just really mindful that she lived at a time of plague. She lived at a time of warfare and violence and division. Um, and yet she was able in that context to, to kind of um, articulate this most remarkable vision of her own experience of the love of God. Um, and it seems to me that there is something eternal about that vision that is for us as well, that whatever other anxieties and fears that we have, uh, we can we can be, you know, we can trust God because God is trustworthy in that sense, and God's love is trustworthy. Um, I'm also inspired, I think, by by the patterns of ministry which I think I see in the lives of the saints. Um, just after his canonization, the other the other year, uh, I began to I began to kind of immerse myself more deeply in the life of um, Saint Oscar Romero. And I was really struck by how in his ministry, the things that I've just been talking about in terms of relationality were lived out. So Romero was an example of someone who I think came with a particular set of priorities to be Archbishop of San Salvador, but then by careful listening, by careful relationship building, by being humble enough to receive what people's um, often very uh, ordinary, humble, poor people had to say to him about their experience. His whole ministry and his whole leadership was transformed by that in a way that we still kind of, you know, talk about and marvel at. Um, now, we may not be called to be Romero, but we are, I think, I think there is something about that pattern of ministry that's really, really helpful to me too and inspiring to me as well. I don't believe actually that people are um, particularly resistant to deep conversations about the meaning of life and the and the purpose of our existence uh, and, and I think the more we can learn sort of humbly and yet confidently to to initiate those kinds of con those conversations uh, the more we will realize uh, how active the spirit of God really is in the life of the world and and the clearer we'll hear those invitations to join in so so that's what gives me hope I think Jonathan, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your perspectives on the church. It's been wonderful to think about relationality, about receptivity and about how we um, might find a new place um, within and amongst our communities with you. Uh, many, many thanks. Thanks, Simon. It's been a real, a real pleasure and privilege. Thank you.